All right, everyone, let's get going. My name is John LeBaron, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today, Digital Shelf SEO and Advertising, How to Optimize Your Amazon Strategy for 2021. Um, again, my name is John LeBaron. We're thrilled today to be joined by our co-founder and CEO, David Wright. He doesn't often get to join us on all these webinars, so we're stoked to have him here today and, uh, and get to learn from him. For those that are not familiar with Pattern, we are a, a global marketplace retailer and e-commerce accelerator. We operate uh, across six different continents, basically, have 18 global offices. Uh, we are a top seller across multiple different platforms and marketplaces in those geographies. And um, you can see on the map here all those different areas where we either operate distribution centers or we operate uh, offices like the one that I'm in here today. Again, uh, for those of you who are just joining here, the session is being recorded and we'll go through about the full hour. We'll, we'll try to leave some time for questions. If you do have questions throughout, feel free to put them into the Q&A window or even into the chat window and I'll try to address them as we get going. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our CEO and co-founder Dave Wright and um, let's get started. All right, thanks, John. <clears throat> All right, yeah, it's really fun to take a few minutes and John pick, you know, try just to pick these really nerdy topics that that I that I that I really like. Um, so he gave a pretty good overview of the company. So we'll just keep going here. Uh, we got we're going to do a live demo. Um, so hopefully, you know, those work. You know, those are how those are how those things go sometimes. Okay, let's let's get going, John. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, one of, the, one of the key things that I think is really key to talk about is we started, you know, eight years ago. And what we found is, you know, most of you are down in the trenches of e-commerce. And, and I was in contact with a lot of the, the CEOs. And the CEOs would oftentimes tell me, hey, my e-commerce team, they're just not that good. And at first, I thought they were right. And now I'm starting to realize that most of these e-commerce teams are actually really quite good, but there's a fundamental problem. And, and we can go through this, you know, of course, you know, in the e-commerce world, the way that you win, and this is on the next slide here, but you know, we'll stay here for now is you have to figure out how to get traffic times conversion times price. And it doesn't matter where you get it. You know, you might get traffic on Mercado Libre or Tmall or Amazon or, you know, on your own website, whatever. Um, but as long as you can bring eyeballs and you can convert those eyeballs times your price, that's how much revenue your, your brand is going to get. Well, this is where, you know, this dilemma starts to come in is we started initially in the early days working with some smaller brands. And these brands would be, you know, anywhere from, you know, like a Kong that's, you know, most of you or many of you are probably familiar with <clears throat> that sells dog toys and, and uh, has some really neat innovations in the pet space. Um, you know, they had three people on their e-commerce team. That seemed normal. And we work with some other of these smaller brands that had three to five people. And then we started reaching into these bit larger brands, you know, like Pandora Jewelry or Panasonic and and uh, sat down with Panasonic's team, and I'm like, hey, how big is e-commerce team? They're like, there's three people. And I'm like, hold on, aren't you guys Panasonic? Well, of course, we have more than three people that do e-commerce at Panasonic, but you know, we have 15 divisions, and we try to keep the brands autonomous. And I've and, and, uh, noticed the same thing with Nestle. We work with Nestle, and, and uh, Nestle, the, the, some of the key brands we work with on the Nestle front have one guy that runs e-commerce. And, and uh, Clorox, same thing. <clears throat> and so what I started realizing is there's really, you know, an executive dilemma here. Because if you just look at the D to C site and what it takes to do that well. So you've got all the logistics. You've got to figure out how to get the packages to the consumers. That generally falls on the e-commerce team, sometimes an ops team. You have, a, uh, you have to be able to run Shopify and just to run Shopify or Magento or Big Commerce or some of these platforms well, or maybe you built your own you know, from scratch. There's a lot of brands doing that. But regardless of how you're doing it, there is an immense amount of work. And then there's all the different pieces of software. In general, people use 19 different softwares to run Shopify well. And again, remember, you've got three people here. 
And, and then you've got to figure out how do I drive all the traffic to the site? So, you know, that's influencer marketing, that's social, that's, you know, Facebook, you know, all of the Google search, you know, SEO. There's a lot of, you could literally have a team of data scientists in that space, just trying to figure out how to drive traffic to your .com. Um, then you've got to execute on that traffic. You've got to convert it. So then you've got to make sure that, you know, the story that you're telling and, you know, your imagery and your, your video and photo and your content is up to par. And then you got to test it, A, B, test it, figure out what's working, what's not working. Maybe this, you have eight images and this, the one in the seven spot needs to go to the one in the number one spot. Maybe the title isn't really articulating the message that you want for the brand and so forth. But all of that A-B testing, just from a pure data science perspective, is overwhelming, you know, in, in many ways. So just to run a, a solid D to C, three people is, you know, as most of you already know, speaking of the choir here, I'm sure with most of you, is, is severely understaffed. Then somebody says, hey, let's do this in Canada. And you have all of those things just twice. Or, and then if you start branching into other languages in, in, in German or, in, or you know, if, you, if you branch out to, um, you can probably handle Australia, but you know, as soon as you go to J Japan, you've got a lot of other complexities. And there's a lot of dollars on the table in a lot of these markets. You know, we run you know, Skechers D2C site in, in China and it's the number three shoe site in all of China, and it brings in a really significant, you know, amount of revenue for them. So there's just a lot of dollars on the table just in that D to C space, and across a lot of different geographies, there's a lot of complexities. Then somebody says, "Well, let's do, you know, we got to figure out Amazon. Amazon, of course, is what we're here to talk about a lot today. But, but the fundamentals of e-com are the same. It comes down to keywords, keyword phrases, and search." is how you win. And then of course, you've got to convert that traffic. But uh, then you start talking about Walmart, Flipkart, JD, you know, eBay and whatnot. And it, this quickly becomes a gigantic, um, a, a gigantic problem to solve for three people, a near impossibility. So oftentimes people will go and find agencies and a lot of these agencies are really, really good, which is, which is a great way to go. But that realization, if it doesn't come at an executive level, that's why I'm calling this an executive, then somebody down in the trenches needs to help the, that executive team understand that, hey, that what you're asking us to do is a near impossibility. And you're not just leaving a million dollars on the table. You may be leaving a hundred million or two hundred million dollars or a half a billion dollars on the table with some of these brands. Um, we just took a brand into Germany. And I got an email yesterday from, from the guy over there. And he says, hey, you know, we just had our first $400,000 day, a single day. And, and uh, that's in, in, in Europe. And so you start realizing there is, there is a lot of dollars that are potentially on the table between good and great here. So I think that's step number one. Mainly when, you, when we're going through a lot of these things today, it will probably seem overwhelming because you know, we have 800 people that do you know, across this, this world. And so of course we spend a lot of time staring at every little detail. But just, just wanna you know, preface things with this so that there's no one that's too overwhelmed here. Um, we, my background is 17 years in the data science, data management world. So if, you know, every executive has some hammer that they tend to hit everything with, mine tends to be data. And people tease me about it, but, but I just think that tech and the data science side of e-commerce is so much fun because there's so many different signals you can get. It's unlike the store where you know, you, there's no way you could get the amount of signals on consumer behavior that you can get in store as you can get in e-commerce. So it's just a really fun place for people who love data to play. So we've built, you know, in 2021, we'll have 180 engineers building on our, you know, working on our platform. <clears throat> and then what we've learned is we've tried just letting people use the software. But the problem is, it goes back to that executive dilemma. There's three guys there and to get really good at even understanding the signals and how to you know, modify it and really optimize it well, it doesn't seem to work as well as we thought. So we just started adding on this services layer. We basically said, here's the green easy button. 
and we'll just do the whole thing for you. Now, oftentimes people are like, you know, we're really good at Facebook marketing or we're really good at Amazon or we're really good at this thing. Whatever you're really good at, keep doing it. Whatever you want help on, you know, grab a company like a pattern and you say, hey, we want you guys to run this lane and we'll run the whole lane, make it a big green easy button for you. Here's our, our uh, tech stack. Uh, we have uh, four products that essentially cover four areas. One is, you know, essentially grow and that's predict. And then all of the distribution and logistics is shelf for us. Market share, you know, and insights is, is, is share. And then we have, a, you know, our advertising piece that we'll talk about today is, is, is what we call destiny. And it covers, you know, a lot of, you know, sits on top of all of these services that you see below. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, so before we get going today, I just wanted to really walk through and make sure everyone's really familiar with this equation. We talked about it briefly before. But everyone understands the way that we generate money in the e-commerce world is we need to bring traffic to the page. Once we bring that traffic to the page, regardless of where we go get that traffic from. So this is where you start looking globally to some degree because you you say to yourself, OK, I've got, you know, um, seven billion people, six to seven billion people, you know, worldwide. You know, who's spending money? Where is the GMB going? And you start looking at Amazon. Amazon's 2019 numbers were 335, 335 billion GMB, and you start looking at um, Alibaba's numbers, and it's 800 billion, and and JD is 300 billion, almost almost equal to Amazon. So you start saying, gosh, you know, you can't ignore China, um, and then you start look. Europe is really significant in you know in compare you know compared to the U.S. Once you do EU5, you've got a larger population. And so you, you start really looking, okay, where can I go get my traffic? How do I get them? How can I get them the cheapest? So if I wanna bring someone to the page, where is the least amount that I have to spend in order to do that? And then I gotta convert them. Conversion, I always harp on this just because it's free money. Once you get someone to the page, whether you convert them or not, you already paid those dollars to get them there. And a lot of people say, gosh, I don't really wanna spend an extra $900 to, to on a video that would be more highly, it's just too expensive. And, and then you start figuring out how much money you're dumping into the traffic side of the equation. You're like, never mind, this whole conversion side makes a ton of sense. Um, just from a data science perspective, I thought it was really fun to focus on the traffic side of the equation. Because I wasn't particularly good at, you know, video and, and so forth. And, and uh, um, we've since built an 8,000 square foot video and photo studio, and we're just pouring a lot of money into that just because mathematically it starts making sense. All right, so then when we look at traffic, which is what we're gonna talk about largely today, is how to bring, and of course there's lots of different types of traffic. There's paid traffic. Once you're organically ranked and that traffic becomes organic, most of you are really familiar with. A lot of these ad agencies play games with all of this stuff, and it's really irritating. You see these ad agencies which, you know, pattern has been tempted to do, but we've just avoided it just from an integrity perspective because you get <clears throat> people that say, hey, you know, we'll take some percentage of your overall ad spend. Anytime an ad agency says, we'll take a percentage of your ad spend, there is no way they aren't motivated to make you spend more money. Even if they are trying to be the most honest people in the world, there's going to be, you know, you're working with an ad agency, there's going to be a hundred people there. So even if you've got 10 or 20 people that are just toeing the line on the integrity side, you're going to have, you know, another 50, maybe it's 10 to 20 percent that aren't. I don't know. But there's always going to be this inherent desire to have you spend more money because that's just how they make money. And it's not an evil thing. It's just, it, you know, I just think it's a bad model overall for, from a brand perspective. Because then you might get things like, you know, we, we all play, seen these games played. Amazon plays them all the time when they give you your numbers on ad spend. Um, you know, either branded traffic or non-branded traffic, they give you an ACoS and you're like, gosh, you know, my ACoS looks great. But we all know that it's, if it's under branded traffic, it's always going to look great versus, you know, if you're conquesting another brand, it's generally going to look pretty pretty terrible. But when you really dive into the data under the covers, Amazon's attribution model is um, 
you know, we all know this is just severely overstated. Um, if you start running, um, we, we run a correlation coefficient on ad spend and, and total sales and, and ad spend and customer loyalty. And we start seeing some pretty dramatic differences between Amazon's attribution models and, and reality, depending on how you spend your dollars. But let's keep going, John. Okay, and this is another little beef I've got. So I've got, of course, one of my big beefs is the way Amazon does their attribution models because I just think it's highway robbery to some degree. I had a brand, we did a test one month with a brand that was doing 3.8 million a month. And uh, we took their ad spend from about, you know, 17,000 a month to 150,000. So we raised their ad spend by 130 grand. We dumped a ton of money into advertising and Amazon turned around and said, Our, we attribute $1.1 million of your business to, to the ad spend. Well, if you look at the bottom line, it went from 3.8 million the previous month to 3.9. So somehow Amazon gave us $1.1 million in new business, according to their attribution models, but the brand only saw a $100,000 lift on $130,000 of extra ad spend. So we essentially you know, didn't even make enough money to pay for the advertising dollars um, in total top line revenue. And this is where, you know, so that's one of the beefs that we'll be talking a little bit about today. My other one is this market share. You see a lot of these companies really spend a lot of time on market share and it is interesting. And I, and I think where market share gets really interesting is in an executive meeting. The executives, they love this because they're oftentimes really competitive and they want to win. They want to know how they compare to their, you know, their peers. And I do think there is value in sort of understanding where you are. Now, the thing that doesn't happen is market share driving in a healthy way where you spend your ad dollars. So a lot of times I see that people trying to combine, you know, market share and these insights and they say, hey, and they come in and they'll wow an executive team with market share. And even if their market share is spot on and perfect, when you then turn around and say, how do I spend my ad dollars? Market share um, is a bad way to look at that because oftentimes people start saying, well, my, my competitor is doing this on advertising. I'm just going to copy them. And you can, and there are tools out there that will basically say, hey, here's your competitors, here's how they're spending their ad dollars, and you start becoming a copycat, which obviously just puts you in the number two position every, every time you turn around. Um, we have blown brands up and never even known what their market share was. We're not really trying to chase a market share number. It will just naturally come when you're winning at a keyword and a keyword phrase level. The magic happens at a keyword and keyword phrase level, which is the foundation of everything um, from an e-commerce perspective. And the fun thing is, is that when you really figure out how to optimize and win at a keyword or keyword phrase level, say at Amazon, you can take that and apply it to your D2C. You can take that and apply it to Walmart. Now, there's always going to be some differences, but for the most part, where you have destiny, where you're destined to win at a keyword or keyword phrase level carries over across these different marketplaces. So let's keep going, John. Okay, this is what we're going to go through today. And John, is there time for questions from the, the, the audience today? Or how do we? Yeah, how's yeah. That handle? we'll be moderating once we get through and a good reminder, good break, I guess, for everyone that's on the call today. If you do have questions, feel free to submit them through the Q&A panel. And um, I'll either get to them at the appropriate time that we interject or when we have time for questions, uh, we'll be able to go, kind of go back and forth. But everyone basically is muted and uh, we'll just go through the Q&As as they type them in. So go ahead. Okay. Um, <clears throat> two concepts here I wanna walk through before we jump into a demo. One is this digital shelf that we've created. And essentially the concept here is we wanted to find out how, who the true competitors to a given product for a brand were. Brands often think, hey, here's my competitive set, and they're oftentimes retail competitors. But when you get into the Amazon landscape, there's a lot of competitors there that don't show up anywhere else. And oftentimes they're more true competitors. They're people really stealing your market share. They're people you're really competing with. 
Um, so what we've done here with this digital shelf is we've taken, for a given product, we'll take an average, you know, around a million different keywords or keyword phrases. We will see where you rank, you know, organically across all of those keywords or keyword phrases. And then we will build your competitive set. So if, say, on, you know, running sock and women's running sock and no-show tab sock, and we go through a, a, a lot of different keywords, and you have a competitor that consistently ranks just adjacent to you, then we would put them on your digital shelf. So if you were to walk up to the digital shelf of Amazon and you do a query, and there's you and there's three or four competitors that are always showing up across all these keywords the same, we would consider them to be on your shelf. Um, and that's your competitive set. Now, um, we have this other concept here, John, and I think let, let's hit, hit the next slide, is, is what we call destiny or ladder destiny. And the idea here is we don't want to spend money forever just buying traffic. So is there a model, and there is, is there a model, the question we asked ourselves in the beginning is, is there a model where we can spend an amount of money and become organically ranked and move on to another keyword or keyword phrase? So for a given product, on average at Pattern, we have about 1,500 keywords to 2,000 that we use for a given product. And we rank all of them according to destiny. And we say, okay, if we're gonna spend an amount of money, where does this product have destiny? And the way that the product generally has destiny, destiny is by being of superior quality, better price, you know, it resonates better with the consumer. It might be, you know, the story behind the brand. It might be the product itself. It might be the pricing. It might be the reviews. But well, all of those things we calculate and we say, does this product for this keyword or keyword phrase have destiny? And so we'll look at the other products on the shelf and we'll say, we believe that for this keyword or keyword phrase, if we dump some dollars here from an advertising perspective, we will win. And then you start laddering up. So you might win in the probiotic space. You might say, hey, I, I think I have destiny on probiotic for women over 50. And that might be your keyword phrase you tackle and initially you have destiny on. Then you might say, gosh, I have dominated that space and I've won on destiny. I have some ad dollars now that are available. I don't need to keep wasting them on this space I've already won. So now let me ladder up a bit. Let me go to key, you know, probiotics for women. And then maybe eventually I start winning probiotic as a, as a core work, you know, as a and of course, that would be a much bigger win. So this is the concept as we start laddering up. Okay, so um, John, are you just flipping the screen to me? Yeah, go ahead and click uh, share screen. Hopefully everything goes through. Demo gods are with us today. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, I can't flip out of my full screen mode here. All right, I think we're, sorry guys for the delay here. I think we're good. You guys good now? John, can you see that? Is that working, John? Yep, yep, I see the home screen of Tableau. Okay, so I just got Tableau up here because what we're showing is just some underlying data and data science on how we've come to some of these things. Um, okay, so I'll first pull up this digital shelf concept. And we're going to just go through, you know, just we could do anybody, but we're going to do feature socks today. I don't know if any of you are 
fans of feature socks. I am, but I'm a pretty avid runner. Um, <clears throat> this is one of our brands. So what I've got here is I just pulled down features as a, as a vendor, as a brand. And then of course they've got, this is all the features ASINs here. So we could pick any of them. I just grabbed the first one in the list. And this is what we've created as their digital shelf. So this is a features unisex high performance, no show, tab sock, large Heather Gray, right? So this is just one particular case. Anybody that is in blue here, any of these ASINs that are in blue on their digital shelf are features, is the features brand itself. So they've got another product or another color or what have you that shows up on its digital shelf as, as uh, very similar. These in orange would be competitors. So let's take a look at this one. And you can drop in and see what the product is on Amazon. Oh, everyone's favorite. This is, you know, Amazon Essentials. So it looks like Features has got, you know, an Amazon brand that's, you know, nipping in its heels here as, as one of the key uh, competitors. Um, I want to move this control over here. Okay, so let's go back. I don't know what this one is here. I, I think I always love to do my demos truly live, so here we go. Yeah, this is a, this is a competitor that they would consider in-store Belega um, and, and uh, is a very close competitor. But you can go through this digital shelf and as I walked through before, this is for across a set of keywords or keyword phrases, these are their true competitive products on Amazon. So this is what our digital shelf is. And everything we do from now on is based on this digital shelf. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, pull up another Tableau dashboard here. And we'll go through Destiny now. So again, this Destiny is based on the digital shelf. Okay, let me pull up features. We'll grab the first product. So this is the same product here. All right, so these are the keywords and keyword phrases that the digital, the products of the digital shelf are winning on. Anything that we don't think is super relevant to digital shelf or they're just not winning on is won't be here. But these are the high relevance and high volume keywords or keyword phrases that the digital shelf is doing well on. And so you start looking at this, you say, okay, running socks, women. Makes sense. You know, women's running socks, women's no show running socks. So it looks like you're starting to see a trend here for the things that are highly relevant that we believe um, we have high destiny on, it's a women's running sock. Now here's features, but notice they spelled features wrong. So that's interesting, something that you know, is, is relevant, um, you know, cushion. And then you start coming down here. These are some of the key words where you're gonna get a, high, a lot of high volume. Anything on the right here is high volume keywords. So, you know, you start popping down here. Down here, the shelf, the digital shelf is not doing incredibly on, but it's, so, these are things you definitely need to start, you need to think about. So socks, women's low cut, um, women's socks. Notice that these are becoming a little more generic to what the digital shelf. So it looks like the things that are really close on the shelf is really a running high performance sock. However, there are just the ankle socks, women's socks, Puma socks. Um, some of these are gonna be you know, branded. It looks like there was an Adidas sock in there, women's athletic sock, you know, Vans no-show socks. So you start, you, know, you get the idea. But we take all of these keywords and keyword phrases that um, we believe we have destiny on and, and we have these four quadrants here. And, and uh, you know, we can, if you wanted, we can just get together and you can say, hey, I just want you to run a product or two of mine through the system. I'm happy to sit down and do it. John can do it and give you some really good ideas on where to focus on search. And some of these things are somewhat obvious, but just game changing in terms of dollars. 
Okay, so now let's go on to the last um, the last tableau. This is our SEO map. Now this is starting to get to the point where you're really saying, okay, well, what should I do now? Um, where should I spend my dollars? And you start looking here. So this is just saying, okay, is the keyword in the title? Everything in blue, the keyword is not in the title. So woman, now notice where, for those of you who are familiar with natural language processing, um, there's a concept of lemmatization or building a lemma. A lemma is essentially the root word. So you can see in this case, you know, the lemma is woman and the non-lemma, you know, variations is women and woman. So in all search engines, Amazon's and most anybody who's at all sophisticated in terms of natural language processing will use one of four main dictionaries for their lemmatization. So we're lemmatizing this to make sure that we, you know, follow the same model that you know, the search engines follow. And, and then we take and we say, where is, then we use um, AI and we say to ourselves, um, we develop a label and I don't, I don't know if, how many of you are familiar with machine learning, but in the machine learning world, it's not as complex, I think, as everybody thinks, but you'll essentially build a label, which is the outcome that you would like in machine. And then you feed all the, these different variables of winnability into the system. And we want to win on a keyword or keyword phrase. And we have all these inputs that go in there. The machine learns over time what types of things could really influence destiny and these destiny ladders. So, um, but we start looking at some of these titles. It looks like we do have no show in the, in the, in the title here. But how in the world do we miss the word woman, right? If you go back to the digital shelf, you know, when we were in the upper quadrant, woman and women were, were all over here. So this is a pretty epic miss that until you really start applying some of the data science to it, you, you just don't, you know, people are building a sock and they're like, hey, this is a sock. We don't really, and, and notice features in there, the way that they see the world, this is a unisex sock. So they do not want to include the word woman on here because it, you know, it sort of goes against, you know, how they perceive this, you know, going. But when you really start pulling the data down on this brand, the word woman is a must. Like it's it's an absolute must here. And you start looking at running. You know, running is also not here. How does that happen? Right. And you start now they, we do have no show. So that's good. You know, and that's pretty high. Um, Ankle, there's woman again. We need to misspell features, it appears, because a lot of people are searching for features with the wrong spelling. Um, normally, you can capture that. Just Normally, you can ignore that just from a natural language processing perspective. Generally, that will work. But when, in this case, feature is clearly, you know, is, is, is another, um, you know, in the natural language processing world, it's not going to be captured as you can see here. Um, good or best, that's interesting. People are, so they're getting out on Amazon and like, hey, what's the good or the, you know, notice the lemmatization here. So if you type in good or best, it will capture both of those. So you don't need both of those words, but you need one of them. Um, so any, in any, I think you guys get the idea. It looks like we got compression here. Um, but just taking a purely data science approach to winnability at a keyword or keyword phrase level, you know, again, using the digital shelf is game changing. And this we're just talking about is the title, right? So now, now you've got to tie everything you're doing from a title and whatnot into your advertising and into your spend. Because all of those things will come together to drive the overall traffic. If someone is searching for you know, women's running sock, and they land on something that says features unisex, and somebody else has a big blaring thing that says women's running sock, when you when the search results pop up on the page, they're going to be, yeah, that's what I was searching for. I was searching for a women's sock. So you, all these things need to start playing together. It's actually just a blast when you, when you start doing this and running it in, in real, you know, in real time. 
and seeing the impact you can have on a, on a given product. It's, it's enormous. Um, and it's really not that hard, but it's, it's really difficult to put all these pieces together um, in, into an overall strategy, especially if you've got you know, three people on the team. I wouldn't be surprised if most of you who are running e-commerce are not diving into machine learning and natural language processing on how to optimize each keyword on your listing. I get it. You know, no one would expect you to. And even your CEO certainly wouldn't either, I wouldn't imagine. But it, it's certainly super impactful. I don't think you can really win without some of the, the, the technology here. Okay. Um, so, John, I'll... I'll I'll flip off the demo and let's keep going. Excellent. So, you know, as promised, this is pretty nerdy, Dave, and uh, hopefully everyone out there is, is tracking along with us and going through. I think as we transition over from the organic notion, the ladder destiny concept, as you talked about a second ago, really extends to advertising as well on the paid side. So as I bring up the next slide, I think one of the, you know, the notions that's pretty powerful for us is that we, you know, we don't spend on advertising, uh, to just generate additional supplementary revenue, right? We, we spend on advertising to build organic rank. And in, ter in, in turn, uh, we end up actually having a very small, a lot of brands that, that are shocked that I speak to are shocked to actually spend less on advertising when they become a, par a pattern partner um, than they were paying before. And I think, you know, I just wanted to kind of lead into that a little bit as you explain this graph a little bit more on how you know, ad spend can increase in, you know, in the beginning, but it's all laddered or, or tied into that notion of improving organic rank and how that gets kind of amortized over time and, and decreases quite precipitously as organic rank improves. So yeah, I'd love for you to start walking through this and transition over the advertising side and how it, it plays into these concepts you've explained. Yeah, yeah. So this is where it gets really fun. So then you start, now, now we're showing a, a chart here you know, you've got your cost per click, you've got your dollars you got to spend. Um, what, of course, what you want to do in this ladder destiny model or in any advertising model, I think that really makes sense, is you're going to spend money with the goal to be ranked organically. Now, if there's 1,500 or 2,000 keywords that you're tracking on a given product, which is not unusual, that's very common. Um, you're going to spend money on, say, 20, and you're really going to double down. And once you win it and you're organically ranked there, the idea is, can you step back? So the way that our tech works, at least, is if we get ranked in the top four slots, the tech will turn off completely. Just turns off on that keyword or that keyword phrase. Now it continues to monitor it and see if it stays organically ranked above seven. We pick seven, but it doesn't matter what you pick. Um, is it falls below seven, then the machine will turn back on again and start pushing ad dollars to see if we can, you know, get back up there on the organic rank. Every time you turn that machine on, I wish this sort of went on, John, you know, in perpetuity here, because the amount that you have to spend on the first run is, is a lot steeper than what you have to spend on runs two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And um, we've picked somewhere between 11 and 14 runs at this to essentially say, this is where you're destined to live. And, and you're probably not going to move the, the needle much more beyond that unless you really take a look at the product. Now, this is where when you partner with somebody, we're always really interested in partnering with brands that say, gosh, you know, what we've really nailed is we have nailed the product. People love it. It's of it, fantastic quality. If we could just get it out there, we know we would win. That's where, you know, we find a lot of synergy versus the guys that are like, Hey, we're just trying to make a quick buck. We put this product together. It, we, we had it manufactured in China. We don't really monitor the quality. And when the customers get it, it comes out to be a, you know, 3.7, 3.5 star rating because your destiny on a product like that is pretty shitty. You know, and so you'll get um, you'll get great traction on if you really spend the time doing a great job at a product level. This model will work tremendously well because you you do have destiny. And so if you're just saying to yourself, gosh, I know I've got an amazing product. I need, I need to get it out there. I need to get, let it have its day in the sun. That's where we're really good. OK, let's keep going. 
Yeah, maybe just one quick comment, Dave, that I think is worth noting in the way, I don't know if you want to speak to the amount of you know money a lot of brands will save with us when they come to advertising and how efficient we are. But if you look at this graph from a pure kind of economic standpoint, this area over here, and I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but this area over to the right side is basically the value created through this ladder destiny strategy. It's actual revenue as your ad cost comes down, you're not that, that money just goes back into investing in other areas and your organic as your organic rank increases or decreases in this case down to, you know, to number one, basically, um, you're actually creating a lot of additional incremental revenue you didn't have before because you were not ranked on those areas. Over here on the left side, you can see that ad spend is actually above organic rank. So in a way, you're actually losing money. And so many brands that just advertise on what I'll call you know, glory keywords or, or marquee keywords or trendy keywords, what are you doing? The CEO says, hey, we have to rank on this, running sock, for example. Um, you can burn a lot of cash. And as you can expect, if your cost per click stays high and your organic rank does not improve, the, the value that you actually are able to, you know, materially recognize is going to be a lot less. And in many cases, it can just be negative. Um, and so I think that's a really important principle to understand. And uh, again, Dave, I don't know if you want to, you know, chat about Amazon's own analysis uh, of our marketing spend, but either way, I think it's it's a principle worth acknowledging. Yeah, that's a that's a great point, John. Um, John, I'm just going to show. I know I'm just branching out here, and you hate it when I do this, but I'm just going to show my screen again. Yeah, yeah, if go for it. Mind. Yep. I've just got a really nerdy spreadsheet that that. Uh, you know, there's a couple points I want to just call out here. Yeah. Um, okay. Can you guys, can you see that, John? Yep. Okay. All right. So this is a pretty deep analysis at a, uh, you know, destiny level growth opportunity for, you know, these ASINs. And we say, you know, what's the average daily units, ASIN of interest, you know, if we can get them ranked, oh, if we can get them ranked in the top five organically, what do we think that is? And then, uh, um, and then we do a bunch of analysis. We say, okay, what are their what are their impressions? What are the top three on the organic side? And then we start just putting dollars to this, and we say, you know, what our estimated A cost is, what our estimated ad revenue per day is, and then we have a winnability index here. Um, and we say, okay, that the ace that this ASIN is now ranked for this keyword or keyword phrase in say the twelfth position. Um, their best the, of our digital shelf, the best position on the shelf is number one. But you can see, you know, these ASINs we're looking at might be ranked, you know, 40, 50, 12, whatnot. But the the shelf is actually doing really well here. The brand, its best brand position is here. You know, so the brand is not particularly winning the shelf in this case. We have, um, I'm not going to go through all the details here, but suffice it to say that the idea here is to calculate how many dollars you think you can get at each search volume. So for every given search term, there's going to be amount of dollars that you can win. And, and, uh, and then how much money does it cost us from an ad perspective? And then where does the brand sit today? You know, and what is its destiny? So notice part of the, you know, things we're looking at here is what it's, you know, the shelf top five average rating and then the product itself. So in this case, the shelf is top five average rating is a 4.6. And well, here's a better one down here. 4.6, which is going to go to a 4.5 when I do a search, you know, because that's the way Amazon does it, is they're going to round that, versus a 4.8 will appear as a five-star product. So I've got high destiny on this keyword or keyword phrase based on just looking at that compared to the competitive set. And this is white socks, women, ankle, right? You know, so we start just breaking this down at a very granular level and, and, uh, um, and, Sadly, this is a must. You just have to break it down this way and, or you just cannot win at scale. Um, all right, John, let's keep going. Sorry for that. 
that break. Good. I think I had a lot of people email me and said, I hope we get a look at spreadsheets today. So that's you're 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 making their training. I'm, I'm sure they did, John. I'm sure they did. <laughs> All right, so this is, you know, that spreadsheet in essence builds this. So we say, you know, how many dollars is it going to take to win? And then how much money do we think we can get by winning this particular keyword or keyword phrase? And then can we even win it? So is the product good enough to win as compared to the competitors at these prices? And if it isn't, then just move right along because you will find a, some area where you can win across 2000 keywords. And then you just start laddering up and then you need to start having product conversations. So if your products are just not good enough, you need to go back to the well and say, gosh, in order for us to win here, we need to create a product that can get a 4.8 star review rather than a 4.3 in order for us to have destiny. If we can do that, there are millions of dollars on the table. All right, let's keep going. Maybe before we move on, we did have a question come in real quick, Dave, that I think, you know, we, we've got about 15 minutes, 13 minutes left before we have to wrap. And uh, again, I would just encourage others that have questions about what we've gone through today to ask a question as well. But this question, do you consider category at all? If yes, how does it relate to your concept of shelf? Yeah, we look at category, but it doesn't play in. When we actually do the math on the digital shelf, we're looking at um, products that are adjacent on search and keyword phrase. So regardless of how Amazon does their categories or, you know, lines things up, we notice a lot of people gaming their categories to get the best seller flag, you know, and, and so forth. But when you, if you were to walk up to a store, you know, you'd be looking at other products that you might otherwise buy. So that is the core concept of our digital shelf, and it's how we build the initial competitive set. Um, so we aren't super focused on category because we think there's just a lot of things that, um, but if you do look at market share, this is part of my beef with market share. If you do look at market share, they're almost entirely focused on category. They don't really pay that much attention to the digital shelf, but the, you know, a lot, a lot of times the thing, the people that you would see um, in a market share report, when you start running keyword after keyword after keyword, you see them compete, but they they might not really be the top competitive set that you need to pay, be paying attention to. But oftentimes they are. Oftentimes the people in your category form your digital shelf. So they're related, but we just think this is one step deeper. Yeah, I, maybe one other comment on that front that I think is interesting. I mean, if you think about the virtual or the, the, the physical shelf at a Walmart or Target or whatever, and you think of something like batteries, right? Batteries will show up on the battery aisle, I guess, but they're also going to show up in the camping aisle, in the electronics aisle. Uh, they might show up at the end cap as you're checking out. And all of those represent discrete digital shelves as well, or, or shelves as well. And the same thing is true you might have you know, batteries camping, batteries flashlight. All those keywords tend to aggregate into different mini shelves um, and, and subcategories that either get manifest at the leaf node or at the subcategory level on Amazon, for example. Uh, and so I think it's a, it's a really interesting comment, but what we often find when we do this analysis for brands is they're either not thinking big enough of the categories that they actually play in, which is like, hey, there's 10 other keywords you've never thought of uh, ranking on or even bidding on, and those have this much velocity to them uh, or impressions, or uh, you're, you're maniacally focused on some area where you think you fit and you're kind of missing, and, and the competitors often are stealing your share in that other category that you were kind of uh, oblivious to. So again, really, really solid question. And again, it, and it gets manifested from where we see it back to that notion of keywords and keyword phrases that kind of belie the, the actual category. So Okay. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Great question. Thank you. And let's just keep going, John, because we only have a couple minutes. All right. This is just very normal and typical advertising strategy now, right? You know, so we use a cabin methodology. There's lots of different methodologies. This is just, uh, you know, cabin doesn't actually include the destiny side of our equation. So what we do in our tech is we have what we call a playbook. And we'll have a playbook for say conquesting. And that playbook in from a tech perspective, um, all it's a, it's a rules-based algorithm for us. So we'll say, okay, how much 
um, money do we, you know, how much money can we spend on conquesting, say, this particular brand? We build a playbook, we set all of our, our variables, and then the machine will go after a number of keywords that we believe would be related to that conquest. And that conquesting would, uh, uh, it would learn over time. So if it tries a keyword or a keyword phrase and it works fantastically, if the feedback loop comes back and says, hey, this is really working, it'll start doubling down on that keyword and it'll start increasing the bid naturally. So we're making millions of bid changes a month organically, you know, just the machine is just doing it. So it's saying, so if somebody starts jacking up the price on say probiotic, the machine will start stepping away from that because it will find better value propositions in other keywords or keyword phrases. Now, um, we've had to build separate playbooks for each of these main topics because on say branded, some of the, your, your specific, you might wanna spend very little money on branded and you might want to uh, blacklist a lot of the branded keywords out of you know, an awareness campaign or a conquesting campaign but all of these, you know, um, play together. But I'm sure at, at, a, at a level, you guys are doing the same thing. Um, I think the only thing I would probably suggest, and there's, there's several different companies out there that have decent tools for this, but without using some tech around this, you, you'll just get destroyed. Um, and some of the tech I really don't like. You know, some of the tech that just focuses on an ACOS metric um, rather than, you know, a rules-based algorithm, I, I, I just don't think they're ever going to win and win big. Um, they're trying to do one thing um, and, they're, and they're just too focused and, and uh, they don't seem to perform as well. Okay, next. Um, yeah, so this is just back to the destiny concept again. And, and uh, but you might, you might be running a lot of different key, uh, models at the same time. So you might have an awareness campaign that you're doing that you're running at the same time as a conquesting campaign where you're going after a key competitor. And, and then you might be doing destiny uh, across a long a set of long tail keywords and all of those things are working in conjunction. This is where brands oftentimes say, hey, what does it matter if I have, you know, 300 Amazon sellers on a platform? If those 300 sellers each have a different strategy, so especially if it relates to like destiny or awareness or what, what, what is your goal? So if you say, hey, I, my goal is to start ranking organically on running sock women because there's, you know, 35,000 searches a month for running sock women. And if I can get into the top five uh, at a conversion rate of, say, 40 percent, I'm going to convert, you know, 20,000 units a month on running sock women. So if I've got an opportunity for 20,000 units and I have a really clear path to do it because I have a high quality product, you're going to be doubling down with the strategy. If you have 300 sellers, the one seller that has the strategy, we find this at times, you know, we'll start doubling down. The tech will start doubling down on winning, running sock women. And then we flip out of the buy box. All of our ads turn off. Somebody else's ads turn on. And they have a branded, you know, you know, search strategy, or maybe they don't even do any advertising. So everything's, you know, at a standstill, and they're just trying to take advantage of any work that any any other sellers do. But you can't have a cohesive strategy generally unless you're coordinated at a tech level. So if you have two highly sophisticated sellers or three highly sophisticated sellers that can have integrated APIs and have a strategy that is working in concert, you can be successful here. But if you've got, you know, 20 different sellers selling one of your products, they each have a different ad strategy, it is really just gonna blow up the overall strategy of becoming organically ranked. Awesome, well, um, I know we got a couple of screenshots of the actual technology kind of under the covers, Dave, but two questions came through that uh, I, I've answered, but I think are, are worth getting your take on as well. The first one is, what are the benefits or risks of using a competitor's brand name as a keyword? Well, it depends on where you're going to put it. So um, are, you, are you talking about, uh, so if, if, if what you can't do is you can't load your products, you can't put a competitor, an actual competitor. Now you can dance around the competitor keywords. So you, can, you guys can fight over keywords. But you can't put an actual competitor 
in you know Amazon as you know part of your keywords that you load in there. Now, Amazon is fine, however, if you pay money to go after a competitor. So if you, from an advertising strategy, say, hey, I'm going to spend money and I want you know an, a slot when someone types in um, Belega socks and I'm features and I pay money to do that, that's that's on um, that that's fine. But there is risk if you are loading your own products underneath a competitor keyword. Excellent. Another question that came through, what would your suggested spend splits be based on the cabin groups? Uh, for example, 10% of spend on C, 10% on A, et cetera. Mm, yeah, that's a good question. It varies pretty dramatically. Um, and it will just depend on the, the machine. So I would just watch. So we would generally would, would start with you know, we usually go pretty light on branded. Um, awareness can be, you know, we're pretty light on awareness. We, we like conquesting sometimes. Um, and, and so, you know, just start, just start load the playbooks and you just, we generally at the beginning will say, hey, let's set these variables so that it, the machine just starts learning. And we start seeing where we, where we get real, real results and real conversion. And, and then we can come back to our brand and say, hey, here's what we think the strategy ought to be, it ought to be, you know, 10% here. Generally, no category is a zero. Um, there's, there's always, you know, money that we're spending in all four, I would say. But your lightest category, of course, I think is, is, is branded. You know, you're going to win branded, you know, that we see. And, and then another area where we see epic mistakes is somebody starts winning a keyword that they're super proud of. There's pretty high search velocity. And then and say it's costing. We, we, I've seen at times where people are spending two hundred thousand dollars a month to win at a, a keyword that's phenomenal and they want it. They own it and they just keep spending the money. And Amazon is like, thank you very much. Thank you very much. But there's, you know, another, you know, 1,499 keywords that they can go and move their money to. Now, they do need to continue to watch that keyword and make sure that they continue to, you know, if they ever drop, that they drop money back on there again. But, but, uh, but that's a pretty big waste of money we see. Um, one of the things, you know, just from a pure tech perspective, we dumped some data from Amazon. And I'm not sure how one of our guys talked to Amazon into giving us this data. But we will spend on average two to three percent of top line revenue, sometimes five percent of top line revenue on advertising. And a lot of the competitors are 10 to 20 percent. And Amazon, um, even by Amazon's numbers, we just pulled down the top 20 other sellers besides, you know, pattern included. And we were around 20 times more efficient on our ad spend. So just really doing this well, the, the, the dollars difference are just, they're just enormous. Excellent. Well, I know we're at time here, Dave. Thank you so much for your insights and expertise today. Appreciate it for everyone that's uh, still on. We will send out a recording to all registrants and attendees. And uh, if we don't chat with you before the end of the year, have a happy holidays. <laughs>